so much for joining us this evening for the second webinar in our pollinator month series beauty of butterflies uh, the butterfly identification webinar so the goal of the indian river lagoon pollinator month is to bring attention to the importance and benefits of lagoon friendly landscaping within the indian river lagoon watershed and make bee and butterfly monitoring more accessible to a wider audience we usually teach these classes in person, but we decided it would be a great opportunity to go virtual and let folks join us from all over the geographic region here in Florida and beyond. So I'm very excited that you all are here today. And also just wanted to take another moment to apologize for last week. We had some major technical difficulties, so I truly appreciate all of your patience with that. I'm not a very tech savvy person, so I do truly appreciate your patience with me on that. And I'm glad that we got the issues resolved so that we could have our webinar this evening. So again, thank you all for joining us. Some of you may have joined us just to learn about butterflies in general or butterflies within this sort of Florida region, um, while others joined to start checking the boxes to become a citizen science bee and butterfly monitoring volunteer at our Titusville native plant garden. So thank you so much again for joining and we'll talk more about that sort of opportunity for those of you, maybe you joined to learn more about bees and butterflies, but now you realize maybe you can make it up to our Titusville office to do that monitoring for us. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. Um, really quick, if anyone cannot hear me or if you cannot see the slide, please let me know. It should be the beauty of butterflies, butterfly identification slide. Hopefully you all can see it. Um, you are all muted and all of your cameras are off. This webinar is being recorded. So you can go ahead and use reactions on the top of your screen to sort of get my attention. You can raise your hand. The best way for us to communicate back and forth is through the chat box. So if you have any questions or any comments or you're having any sort of te technical difficulties on your end, please go ahead and type that into the chat box. We are not gonna use the Q&A function for these webinars. We're gonna use the chat box for both our sort of Q&A section at the end, as well as sort of back and forth conversation. That way it's all in one place and I can just go to the chat box to meet all of those needs. So again, we are in part two of our webinar series. Once again, this webinar is recorded. You're all muted, so please use the chat box. As you can see on this slide, Q&A questions, please put them in the chat box and we will try to make some time to answer them at the end. We have a lot of butterflies to get to today. Also, feel free to use the reactions at the top of your screen. So for those of you who were here last week, these first couple of slides are going to be a quick review so we can kind of jump into butterflies and butterfly ID once we get everybody sort of on the same page. So you have joined a webinar hosted by the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. That's what's on my shirt. That's our logo for the webinar. Um, and if you all decide to come join us as volunteers at the garden, you will be a volunteer for the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, which is the state's lead agency for environmental management and stewardship. So within that giant Florida Department of Environmental Protection, I work out of the Indian River Lagoon Aquatic Preserves Office. So our office is located in Fort Pierce, like I mentioned in the chat, and we manage seven aquatic preserves across six counties and six traditional indigenous territories. We manage around 97,112 acres, over 150 spoil islands, and we do a myriad of work focusing on research, stewardship, and outreach. We do everything from snorkeling and monitoring seagrass beds to monitoring oyster reefs, bird nesting. We currently have a telemetry project with horseshoe crabs where we're tagging horseshoe crabs, trying to learn a little bit more about their movement and population. We also do some work with diamondback terrapins, a wide variety of work all throughout the Indian River Lagoon. You can see on the map on this slide, all of the yellow areas are considered aquatic preserve. So we manage aquatic preserves that go all the way down into Northern Palm Beach County and then all the way up the Indian River Lagoon into Mosquito Lagoon, which is our most northern aquatic preserve. So last webinar, we talked a bit about watersheds and runoff and how particularly 
traditional landscaping within the Indian River Lagoon watershed is causing a lot of water quality problems. So just a quick review, a watershed is a land area that channels rainfall into creeks, streams, rivers, and eventually to outflow points such as bays and oceans. So the Indian River Lagoon watershed is this area sort of in the darker orange on this map. And as you can see, it encompasses a huge land area. It's actually larger than the entire state of Delaware. And all of the rainwater that falls within that orange area eventually makes its way into the lagoon, which is that darker blue water section that you can also see on the map. So what we do within this Indian River Lagoon watershed dramatically impacts our water condition and quality within the Indian River Lagoon itself. So as the population has boomed throughout this six county area, so has the amount of runoff entering the lagoon through storm drains, through um, canals, and also from natural runoff through rivers. So all of the rain that falls onto that orange landmass and all of the water that we sort of use as people on that landmass eventually makes its way into the Indian River Lagoon. So since the sort of boom of development in this region from 1920 to 1990, Average annual runoff or that fresh water entering the lagoon has increased 113% due to this development and the increase in nutrient loads associated with fertilizer, lawn care chemicals, pond maintenance, herbicides and pesticides has also increased dramatically. And that's causing quite a bit of water quality and water condition problems in the Indian River Lagoon. So the main takeaway from this slide is really just looking at that watershed map and seeing where you live because if you live near the Indian River Lagoon, you most likely live within that watershed area. So what we do within that watershed area makes a difference. So the garden project was born from this idea of sharing with all of those people who live within this lagoon area that they can make a difference. So the garden project is a community demonstration garden that we use to promote lagoon friendly landscaping practices and provide habitat for native bees and butterflies. So residents who incorporate these lagoon friendly and Florida friendly landscaping principles that we are showing off on our garden can help make a positive impact by lessening that runoff entering the Indian River Lagoon and also providing habitat for some really cool upland critters like bees and butterflies. So our webinar last week really covered why this lagoon friendly landscaping is so important and sort of how it works and the difference it can make for some of those really amazing upland critters. So if you want more information on that, I highly recommend going back and watching the webinar um, that we had, the first one of our series, Buzz About Lagoon Friendly Landscaping, which I'm going to send out and we will hopefully get on YouTube for anybody to check out. So I will keep you all posted when we are able to do that. So through this garden project, we would have loved to have done some calculations and some science to figure out if, what sort of nitrogen runoff we were saving. However, that's out of my capacity here for me. So instead, we decided to monitor bee and butterfly use of this garden and really show how cool lagoon friendly landscaping, landscaping can be and show off the sort of beautiful butterflies that you would get in your yard if you do implement these lagoon friendly landscaping practices. So we have our line transect surveys that we conduct once a month. We've been doing this for about 12 months now, and we're hoping to continue to do this for quite a while. And we walk a transect. So it's seven minutes of walking that sort of red line in the garden area, which this is a Google Earth photo from before the garden was planted. So that's why it looks like grass, because that's what it was before. So we walk our about seven and a half minute transect. We walk about 10 feet per minute, looking for all of the butterflies that are flying in front of us, to the sides of us, and up to 15 feet overhead. And we do that with our slow 10 feet per minute walk on our side of the street through the garden. And then we go ahead and walk across the street and repeat that same exact process in what I usually refer to as a traditional lawn or European lawn. So this property across the street, I refer to as a traditional or European lawn because it's sort of the stereotypical lawn you would think about people having in the United States. And that stereotypical lawn actually came to North America with Europeans. This was sort of a cultural idea that came from 
royalty in Europe and sort of the idea of castles having lawns. So that's how the concept of these sort of traditional lawns that we see often in the United States got here to North America. It was actually European influence. Before that, um, people didn't have these lawns trying to emulate sort of status and castles and things of that nature. So we know today that these traditional European lawns are quite terrible for local wildlife and for our water quality of our estuaries and rivers and things like that because traditional European lawns require non-native plant species. So these turf grass species that we're using on Florida lawns typically aren't native. It's sort of a monoculture of the same plant and it often requires pretty heavy irrigation as well as um, fertilizer. And also people like to spray pesticides and herbicides or weed killers on these traditional lawns as well. So we are comparing our sort of native plant garden where we've invited back these native species and are pr promoting sort of a wild Florida on our side of the lawn and compare that to the numbers of butterflies we see when we walk across the street and are taking sort of a survey of that traditional lawn where it's sort of a monoculture, heavily irrigated, all the things that hurt the Indian River Lagoon lawn wise. So we went over these numbers last PowerPoint, so we're not going to take much time here, but we are finding a much larger abundance of butterflies on our sort of native plant garden area versus that lawn directly across the street. So all of these species are able to move from one side of the street to the other. They can fly that far. They're just choosing to hang out in the native plant garden versus on that traditional European turf lawn. So again, if you're interested in this information, I encourage you to go back and check out our webinar, the first part of our series, Buzz about lagoon friendly landscaping, which we're hoping to get up on YouTube. So we also showed this picture last uh, webinar of the different butterflies that we've seen in the garden. And today we will hop into butterfly identification so that you can learn the names of these different groups of butterflies and a little bit more about them. So let's go ahead and hop into butterflies. Again, if you all have any questions throughout this entire webinar, please feel free to put the questions in the chat. And then at the end, I will go ahead and visit that chat box and look through and see how many questions we can answer. So if you have any questions about the lagoon friendly landscaping or any questions about the butterflies and the butterfly groups that we're going through today, please feel free to put them in the chat. I could go on for butter about butterflies for hours. Um, so a lot of detail is probably gonna be lost in this webinar because we're trying to crunch it into an hour. So if you have any butterfly related questions, feel free to type it into the box and I will do the best I can to answer them. So butterflies, butterflies and moths come from the same family, but butterflies are sort of, you can think of them as our day flying moths. So butterflies are active during the day. They typically have bright coloring. Most butterflies have clubbed antenna. So if you look at this photo of this butterfly, you can see sort of, this picture is a little blurry, but you can see sort of that clubbed shape, that rounded shape on the edge of the antenna. A lot of moth species don't have that. They have more feathery antenna. Butterflies typically, and maybe not even typically, but a lot of butterflies rest with their wings together, closed. So like these guys behind me, that would be how a lot of butterflies rest. Whereas moths, a lot of them you find in sort of a tented position, which we will talk about at the end of the PowerPoint a little bit more. And in the DEP native plant garden, we find butterfly eggs, caterpillars, and chrysalis on host plants throughout the garden. And if you have native host plants in your landscape, you are probably finding that as well. There are several morpho groups of butterflies. So morpho groups are sort of groups of organisms that look similar. So we put them into these morpho group categories because it's easier for identification. A lot of these morpho groups are actually families of butterflies, so that makes it easier. But if you join us for our bee webinar um, at the end of the month, you will see that we have our bees in morpho groups and those don't follow families as nicely as our butterfly morpho groups do. So really quick, got to talk about some basic anatomy before we jump into this identification. So when we say dorsal, that's the view of a butterfly from above. When we say ventral, that's the view of a butterfly from below. So from below would be their legs and the bottom of their wings. And then dorsal would be that sort of top um, view of a butterfly. Imagine them flying. So ventral would be underneath and dorsal would be above if a butterfly is flying. When butterflies have their wings closed, like these guys behind me, we are seeing the ventral view of the butterfly because they have their wings closed. 
that's the underneath of the wing. If the butterfly were to open its wings on top of that blade of grass, then we would be seeing the dorsal side of the butterfly. Also, four wings are, you can see on this diagram here, the front wings on the butterfly, whereas dorsal, or sorry, hind wings are the back wings of the butterfly. So that makes sense. Butterflies are insects, so they have heads, thoraxes, and abdomen. So abdomen, their stomach, is that largest sort of body part at the bottom, and they have six legs, like the rest of the insects do. We know probably from childhood that butterflies go through a multiple stage life and go through metamorphosis. So they start as eggs that are laid by female butterflies, then they hatch into larvae, which are caterpillars, and the caterpillar's role is just to eat as much as possible. Um, and caterpillars often get eaten by other animals such as birds. Caterpillars are a very, very important protein source for many species of native birds. Um, then if they make it through the caterpillar stage, they go into the pupa stage, which is when they form their chrysalis, or if they are more moth-like species, then they would form a cocoon, which we can talk about that later during the Q&A if any of you have questions on chrysalis versus cocoons. And then they emerge as adults. So the main priority of adult butterflies is to reproduce. Um, these insects emerge from their metamorphosis with wings, allowing them to fly farther and spread their genetics farther across the region. So that is the main goal of adult butterflies is to reproduce. Some species barely even eat any nectar when they are adults because they are solely focusing on reproducing before they die. Um, so. Again, any questions about butterflies, please put it in the chat box because I can't go too in depth now. We got to get through some identification. So we have eight major morpho groups of butterflies, and this is broken down into 16 groups for monitoring. So we have swallowtails, whites, sulfurs, hair streaks, blues, metal marks, all of the brush foot groups that you can see listed there, leaf mimics, ladies and admirals, heliconians and fritillaries, crescents, buckeyes, emperors, satyrs, royalty. Then we have the skippers, which include the spread wing skippers, which include long tail, dusky wing, and cloudy wing butterflies. Then we also have grass skippers and giant skippers. So as you can see, we have a lot to go through tonight. So hope you're all ready. Here again are our morpho groups with a little bit of descriptions. So if you do come join us for our monitoring, or even if you don't, because I'm happy to send it to you, we have a specific butterfly morpho guide that we've made for our monitoring, which applies to this region of Florida, this sort of eastern central coast. So if you live from Palm Beach County up into Volusia County, our butterfly guide should include most of the native butterflies that you would be seeing. And the front page has all of these little descriptions. And then as you flip through the booklet, you get to pictures of each individual butterfly species. So I'm happy to send that all to you in the follow-up email. And then of course, if you come join our monitoring team, you will get that packet as well. So the first group we're going to jump into this evening is swallowtails. So swallowtails are our biggest butterflies. Um, swallowtails can be two and a half to six and a half inches in wingspan. So this would be an example of a six and a half inch wingspan swallowtail. So quite large, you can see in comparison to my hand. Um, so they can be up to six and a half inches or as small as two and a half inches, which it's still a decent size in comparison to my hand, but these are our biggest butterflies. This is the biggest butterfly family physically, size-wise, in the world. So the Queen Alexandria birdwing is the largest butterfly on Earth. It's found in Papua New Guinea, and it has a wingspan of 12 inches. So personally, I think that that is kind of terrifying. That is a huge butterfly, so I'm kind of glad that ours only get up to six and a half inches. But anyway, swallowtails are typically bright butterflies. Like we said, they're large. You kind of can't miss them. So again, this is our first morpho group of butterflies, and we will go ahead and run through every species we have in this morpho group. So this is our zebra swallowtail. It has zebra stripes. This is our eastern tiger swallowtail. It has tiger stripes. Also note that there are some darker female forms of this species. So you might see an eastern tiger swallowtail that looks a little bit different. We also have pipe vine swallowtails. Pipe vine swallowtails are the species that female tiger swallowtails are trying to mimic because pipe vine swallowtails are poisonous to predators or at least distasteful. So they accumulate a toxin because their caterpillar 
eats a plant called birthwort, and that has a chemical toxin in it that the butterfly then uses to become distasteful or even toxic to predators. So you'll see some other butterfly species trying to pretend and mimic, acting like they're pipe vine swallowtails to fool predators. So another one, a spice, spice bush swallowtail, very similar to the pipe vine swallowtail. Again, probably trying to mimic that poisonous species. Giant swallowtail is really large and is quite bright yellow and dark. Eastern black swallowtail, Palamedes swallowtail, Polydamus swallowtail. Now this swallowtail actually has no tails, so, but it still is a large butterfly, quite bold and colorful, flies kind of high and aloof compared to some of our smaller species of butterfly. And then the red spotted purple, which we put in the swallowtail category because it could be confused for a pipe vine swallowtail. Again, it's trying to mimic that poisonous species. And these guys are not swallowtails. These are brushfoots pretending that they're swallowtails. So we go ahead and put it in the swallowtail morpho group just in case our volunteers are out monitoring and they see a red spotted purple and think that it is a swallowtail. That's why we keep them all in the same morpho group because these guys are quite a large size. And again, they're trying to mimic that pipe vine swallowtail so they can be easily confused. So now we're moving on to our next butterfly family. This webinar is really just a crash course in butterflies. Um, we are, you're not going to be able to leave this webinar and have all of the ID tips that you need to identify down to individual species for the most part. Uh, this is sort of the beginning of your butterfly learning journey. We're going to go through all these morpho groups and we're going to go through every species in these morpho groups. And I encourage you to go back and watch this presentation again, or I'm going to be sending out the slides, which have those ID tips in the top right corner, as well as sort of the diagrams with the specific parts of the butterfly circled for identification. So you can go back through these PowerPoint slides yourself on your own time and really get to know each individual species. But since we only have an hour and we have a hundred and probably 30 something butterflies in our region, uh, we're going to be moving really fast paced. So now we're already at our next family, the whites. So white butterflies are sort of small to medium in size. We have about an inch and a half here to about a three and a half inch wingspan. So sort of a medium sized butterfly. I know the sizing is a little bit hard on a webinar, but once you know what these butterflies look like and you see them in the field, you won't forget them. Um, whites are often found flying in open sunny areas. We see quite a bit of them in the garden. Um, we also have same situation here where we have a brush foot butterfly in this category and that butterfly is the white peacock. Um, we have three true white family butterflies in this morpho group. And then, a, like I said, that white peacock butterfly as well. So the great southern white, we see this guy in the garden often. And this is the time of year where I start to see these butterflies more and more. So the great southern white has blue clubbed antenna up here. Uh, you can see them pretty well in this photo. Um, these two, that one, not as much. It looks like the coloring is a little off. But all great southern white butterflies have this blue little clubbed antenna piece. And that is a surefire way to tell them apart from the other whites. Females can be a little darker gray, have some darker coloring, but they're mostly white with sort of this black wing margin. Now we have the checkered white. This guy looks a little bit different because they're checkered. So the females have a little bit more of that darker coloring. Males are a little bit more white. And then the cabbage white. Males have one dot and females have two dots. And then the Florida white. We have not seen this species in the garden. I doubt we will ever see this species in the garden. Uh, it has a historical record all the way up into Brevard County, but it's really more of a South Florida species of butterfly. So we're not really gonna worry about that one too much. This guy does not have blue clubbed antenna. So remember that's only the great Southern white and that's how you can really tell those butterflies apart from the rest of the whites. Then here's our brush foot that sort of wiggled its way into this category, the white peacock. So the white peacock butterfly is also sort of that medium size, maybe even pushing into the large category a little bit, maybe a little bit bigger than that three and a half inches. They're mostly white. Some of them show a little bit more orange, like this picture on the bottom left. Um, they have 
two hind wing spots in one fore wing spot. So you can see that here on this ventral photo. And these guys have a little bit more coloring pattern and pizzazz maybe than our other white butterflies do. So now next family, told you we were going fast. Now we've hopped into sulfurs. So this is actually the same family as white butterflies. However, these are the butterflies in that family that are yellow or orange. So these butterflies are a little bit smaller, generally one inch, which is quite small, <laughs> to three inches in size. So they can get a little bit bigger. Our bigger species are the cloudless sulfur and the orange sulfur, which would be closer to this three inches. And then we have some tiny species like the dainty sulfur, which are probably really only this one inch size, which is quite small compared to my hand. They are also often found flying in open sunny areas and their host plant family is pea family plants, which we have in the garden. So we do see quite a bit of large size sulfurs, which would be that three inch range and small size sulfur, which would be closer to that one inch range. And that's what we break them up into for monitoring. I ask that my volunteers either categorize them as large sulfurs or small sulfurs since there's such a large range in species for this category. So this is the cloudless sulfur butterfly. I am sure that you all have seen a cloudless sulfur. These guys are quite common. You see them flying in open sunny areas. Again, they're more of that three inch size, so they're quite large. And when they fly by, all you really see is yellow, just kind of a light yellow color. And then we have the orange barred sulfur. We see this butterfly a little bit less. It's, I would say it's less common than that cloudless sulfur in our region. Um, it's a bit darker yellow. The cloudless sulfur is quite a lighter yellow color, whereas the orange barred sulfur is more of a darker yellow, and it has those these orange patches that you can see on its dorsal side when its wings are open, and then when its wings are closed, it's just, again, that more darker yellow. Um, it's not a resident of that sort of northern Brevard region where the garden is. It can temporarily move up into that region when it's expanding maybe in the springtime but it's not a permanent resident and we see many more cloudless sulfurs next we have the southern dog face can you see the dog face on the dorsal side of the butterfly so right here where my mouse is is the dog eye and this is the dog's head and mouth so that's the southern dog face these guys are a bit smaller than cloudless sulfurs not by too much and then i also say here on the um, ventral side, you can see the dog eye. So we have the dog face, and then when its wings are closed, there's the dog's eye. Then we have the orange sulfur. Looks kind of similar. Um, it's a little less common. And when you compare it to the southern dog face, this one doesn't have a dog face or a dog eye. It has sort of similar markings, but not quite the same. You don't see that dog face outline, and you don't see that real distinct eye spot. Then we have the sleepy orange. So this whole butterfly is named after the fact that it has these little dark markings here, which are supposed to look like closed eyes. So I don't know who named this butterfly, but that seems like a really specific thing to point out to name the whole species after. But that is why they're called the sleepy orange and that is the main identifying characteristic. I also think that on these butterflies on the ventral side, you can sort of see those kind of look like sleepy eyes too. But as you can see, uh, they're not always as dark. But for Sleepy Orange, they always have that little closed eyelid right there. I, I did not name these butterflies. I'm not an entomologist by training. So it's not my fault that they have these names. Um, next is the little yellow. has these two little spots. Those are our, its identifying characteristic. Then we have the barred yellow. Same guys that are right here behind me for this whole webinar. The barred yellow kind of has this dusted ventral look and when it's flying, typically low to the ground because that's what the species does. Sometimes you can see the, that black bar when its wings are open and it's fluttering around. But the best way to ID butterflies is when they're holding still on plants and this ventral dusted view is what you get. And then our smallest sulfur butterfly is the dainty sulfur. This one can look quite similar to the barred sulfur or barred yellow. Um, however, when again, when this butterfly stops on a flower or a leaf, you can look and see these two dark spots that the barred yellow does not have. 
Otherwise, they look quite similar, although the dainty sulfur is quite a bit smaller. Next group is hair streaks. So hair streaks are really cool. This is one of my favorite groups of butterflies. They have thin hair-like tails that come off of their hind wings. And what they'll do when they're resting on plants is they'll take that hind wing and move it back and forth like this, um, trying to distract predators with their tails and trick predators into thinking that their tails are their antenna. So if I were a bird or a lizard and I wanted to go take a nibble off of a butterfly, that I would bite the hair streaks tails thinking it's their head because these butterflies want to protect their heads at all costs, right? That's the most important part of their body. Whereas if they get chomped sort of on the wings, that's obviously a big detriment to them flying wise, but they're still going to be alive. So that's why they have these hair tails and you'll see them if you do see some hair streaks up close, wiggling their hind wings back and forth. And it's really adorable in my opinion. So these guys are often kind of brown or cool colors and they're quite small. These guys are typically about one to two inches. So again, here's our one inch, quite, quite small, and two inches, a little bit bigger, but still not the largest butterfly. I would say they're a bit closer to one inch, the ones that I've seen in our region. So the great purple hair streak um, has sort of an orange abdomen and has these hair tails, as you can see, dark colors. Then we have the red banded hair streak with this large red band. And again, you can see the hair tails on the hind wing of the butterfly. Southern oak hair streak, again, got those hair tails, that signature hair streak feature. Some more red and white sort of lines and bands. You'll see that a lot on these guys. The white M hair streak has an M right here on its hind wing. And again, those hair tail features, more white bands and orange coloring on the gray hair streak. Banded hair streak just has even more bands, but again, they all have these hair tails. Now the sweeteners juniper hair streak is something that I would not expect to see in the garden, but maybe some of you would see it in your adventures along our sort of Florida's east coast. So the sweeteners juniper hair streak is an endemic and endangered species. So this is a species that is only found in the St. Augustine area and is an endangered species. So it's highly dependent on coastal cedar strands and it has most likely been brought to the brink of extinction, so this endangered species um, category, due to habitat destruction of these coastal cedar strands. So again, as we came and developed this area, we tore out a lot of coastal cedar and that is one of the main reasons we think that this butterfly is endangered, is due solely to habitat loss. It has been observed in Volusia County, so part of our Indian River Lagoon range, but there have been no reported sightings in Brevard County or south of there. So you may have a chance of seeing these guys in Volusia, and if you do, definitely let an entomologist know because it is definitely of conservation interest. Henry's Elfin, this is another species I don't think we would see in our sort of open sunny garden, but you could find it in wooded areas of our region. And one of my favorite butterflies to talk about, the Atala. So the Atala, some people call it the Kunti hair streak, is part of the hair streak family, but it does not have any hair tails. Instead, it has a bright orange abdomen, black wings, and then some iridescent blue. This butterfly is a can't miss. Um, it's really interesting looking with that orange abdomen and that contract with, with those dark colors. And it also has a very interesting conservation story. So for those of you who don't know about the Atala, in 1888, it was known as the most conspicuous insect in South Florida. So very common, people saw it all the time. Um, Atalas were found th throughout a lot of Florida, all of South Florida up and through the central part of Florida, um, pushing into sort of Northern Brevard. Um, However, it went from being one of the most common and easily recognized insects in the region to being extinct. We thought it was extinct from 1937 to 1959 due to the overharvesting of its host plant, Kunti. Um, Kunti is a cycad, so it is it comes from a family of plants that has been around since the dinosaurs. So these plants have been around since before pollination by insects really existed or came about. So 
Kunti is North America's only cycad. It's really the only plant native to North America that has been left over since the dinosaur and made it through some of those major mass extinctions. Um, and Native Americans had been processing Kunti to use for flour for many years before the arrival of white settlers. However, when white settlers came into the region and learned how to process Kunti for themselves, they overharvested the plant and wiped out much of the natural population of this plant throughout the state. So the harvesting of Kunti was used to make arrowroot powder. So Kunti actually warning before you put it in your landscape is very toxic so all parts of the plant are toxic and i believe the cones can actually be fatal if ingested so just fyi before you go plant this in your landscape it is very toxic however native americans learned how to process that toxin and get rid of it and use the plant for a flower that wouldn't spoil in the florida heat so again white settlers came in mimicked this process and began over harvesting this plant um, to get flour that wouldn't go bad with how hot it was in Florida without air conditioning and without refrigerators. So today the Atala and its host plant Kunti are making a comeback due to the planting of Kunti in managed gardens and landscapes. So I believe there might still be might uh, a native population of Kunti in sort of that pine rockland habitat that has been conserved in South Florida, a very small strip of it, but otherwise Atollas have made it back from the brink of extinction by people putting Kunti in their landscapes and helping to foster this plant population back to health, which then brought back the butterfly population. So it's a really great conservation story, really showing how residents and municipalities and people who live in a region can make an impact by bringing back native plants, which can even bring back native species that we thought were lost and were very important to our Florida landscape and region and very special to us because Atala butterflies really aren't found outside of our region. Um, so it's really great that the Atala and the Kunti are coming back into our landscapes. So we'll go ahead and jump to our next category of butterfly now that we're done nerding out about some Atala conservation, which is one of my favorite things to talk about. Now we're gonna talk about blues, which have some more great conservation stories and are a really amazing and unique group of butterflies. So blue butterflies, we have a couple species in Florida. They are teeny, teeny, tiny. So these guys are about a half an inch to an inch and a quarter. So these guys are quite small. This would be a big blue. And this would be one of our tiny blue species. So really, really small. These butterflies are barely noticeable. Most people think that they're moths, but you'll see them fluttering along the ground in the daytime. And they kind of have a bluish hue when they're fluttering around because you see glimpses of their dorsal view. When you see these butterflies most of the time landed, their wings are going to be closed. So all of our ID for these blue butterfly species have to do with that ventral wing. So when the wings are closed and you're seeing the bottom side of the wings. So first we have the eastern pygmy blue. Again, it's very rare to see them with their wings open. They flutter around really quickly low across the ground so you'll see glimpses of a bluish hue but really what you'll see when this butterfly lands the identifying characteristic is these four dark spots on the ventral wing then the cassius blue same thing you'll see that fluttering along the ground but they only have two of these ventral spots then the serranus blue same thing you'll see this butterfly fluttering around on the ground and when it pauses that's when you can really make your id to species and get that one big ventral dot. So if it has one dot, it's a Serranus blue. If it has two, it's a Cassius blue. And if it has four, it's an Eastern Pygmy blue. And I believe we have seen all three of these species in the garden. They're quite common. Again, they're just small, so people don't notice them. But now that you know that they're around, if you go and look at it sort of like a grassy area or an area with flowers, you'll see a tiny butterfly fluttering around. Um, when they land, you can try to identify it by those ventral wing spots. So we do have four species of blue in Florida. However, I would say you're probably only ever going to see three of them. If you see this fourth species, you are extremely lucky because, again, this is another endemic and endangered species. So the species of butterfly is only found in Florida, and it is also an endangered species. 
So the Miami blue had a historic range um, from Volusia County all the way down into Monroe County. So from our entire Indian River Lagoon range and then even further south. It disappeared from the Florida mainlands by the 1980s. And again, we thought this butterfly was extinct completely until someone discovered a Miami blue in Bahia Honda State Park in the lower Florida Keys in 1999. Then in 2006, another population was found in the Key West National Wildlife Refuge, so really holding on to some habitat down there in the Keys. Um, unfortunately, the Bahia Honda State Park population disappeared in 2010, and the main driver of this species, the Miami Blue, decline is unknown, but habitat loss and coastal development has dramatically decreased their range. So you'll see for a lot of these butterfly species, the main factor in species and population decline is development. It's habitat loss. So for butterflies, when you take away their host plants, they can no longer reproduce. They have evolved over thousands of years with native host plants in this region. So our native butterflies and our native host plants go hand in hand. So when we rip out um, native plant areas and replace them with lawns or buildings or whatever else we're using up land for and we don't agriculture and we don't maintain these sort of native plant populations, we lose a lot of our native butterflies because they're so dependent on these native host plants. Like I said, they've evolved together over thousands of years. So for these Miami blues, their primary host plants are gray knicker bean, balloon vine, and black beet. So these are all coastal plants. And where do we all love to live? and hang out and spend most of our time in Florida, the beach. I'll admit, I love the beach. I'm there all the time on my day off. But the development of these coastal areas has definitely kicked these Miami blue butterflies out. And then hurricanes, invasive species, and population isolation continue to kind of just make blows on this population and sort of drive this decline further and further. So sorry, that's not a very positive conservation story, but unfortunately it is a story that we need to share. So jumping to our next group, there's only one butterfly in the little metal mark group and it's the little metal mark. This butterfly is one of a kind. It's very small. It's only a half an inch to an inch in wingspan. So again, very small, kind of around the size of those blue butterflies. And it is orange with shiny metal markings. So that one's easy to remember. Now, the brushfoot family, we'll hop into this one really quickly. Uh, brushfoots are butterflies. Again, all butterflies are insects, so they have six legs, but our brushfoots have adapted their front two legs for tasting. So they use these legs as chemical receptors, sort of tasting flowers and looking for their host plants. So these butterflies look like they only have four legs when really they have six, they just have made their front two a little bit special. So the brushfoot family is huge, so we break this down into smaller categories. We have leaf mimics, so these are butterflies that pretend to be leaves to hide from predators. They're about one and a quarter to three inches in wingspan, so kind of that small to medium size. And these guys a lot of times can be found in sort of wooded forested areas because they're trying to blend in with leaves. So we have the question mark. Again, I didn't name these butterflies. This butterfly is named after that little question mark there that's in that yellow circle. Now the Eastern comma, guess what? This butterfly is also named after this little punctuation mark on its ventral hind wing. Then we have the American snout, named because of that snout. So you can see it has what looks like a giant nose. So that one's an easy one to remember, the American snout. Um, why the giant snout? No one is truly sure. However, um, scientists think that that might help it look even more like a leaf um, because that would be sort of that leaf um, stem, which I can't remember the scientific word for, but you have the leaf and then the little piece that attaches to the plant. That snout is supposed to be that piece that attaches to the plant. Ruddy dagger wing. Um, this butterfly isn't as leaf mimic looking, but we still put it in this category. If you saw a ruddy dagger wing, I'm pretty sure you'd know. Look at those giant daggers coming out of its hind wings. Next group is ladies and admirals. Um, these are brushfoots that I say are trying to be leaf mimics, but they have a little bit more flair. So the American lady has 
two hind wing eye spots. The painted lady has four. And the red admiral has this pinkish reddish color here that gives it some pizzazz and takes it out of the leaf mimic category and puts it into this category of ladies and admirals. Next, heliconians and fritillaries. You might be familiar with some of these species. These guys all have long wings um, and all of their host plant is the passion flower vine on those species. So we have a couple species of passion flower in the state um, and these guys use those plants. So they're about two and a half to four inches. So these guys can be quite large. I would say they're, yeah, a medium to large size butterfly. But again, they all have really long wings that make them stand out. So the Gulf fritillary, this butterfly is super, super common. You may have seen a Gulf fritillary and thought it was a monarch. They have these white silvery spots on their ventral side and um, this sort of orange and brown coloring on the top. I listened to a podcast called Ologies and the woman who is the host of that podcast described Gulf fritillaries as a Thanksgiving table spread on top and a Lady Gaga disco concert on the bottom. So that ventral view with all that sort of glittery white and then that top with more of that brown look. Then we have the variegated fritillary. We don't see this butterfly as much. It's quite a bit smaller than the other fritillaries. So um, it looks a little bit more like crescents. Then we have the Julia, nice long wings and orange. And then the zebra longwing is our state butterfly. I'm sure you all have seen this butterfly with its zebra stripes and its long wings. So an easy one to remember, zebra longwing, our state butterfly. Next, we're gonna jump into crescents. So crescents, oh, really quick, I got ahead of myself. Crescents are quite small, about one and a half to almost three inches. So these butterflies are quite small and have intricate, oh, what happened? Oh, hold on one second. Let me get us back to where we were. Here we go. Okay, so crescents are quite small and they have this intricate orange pattern. So the Cuban crescent has sort of this wing indentation. Crescents are really hard to tell the species apart. So we just wanna stick to crescent when we are identifying them for our monitoring. The foam crescent has this white band here on the forewing. And the pearl crescent has this little pearly area on the hindwing. That's why I'm saying crescents are very hard to ID down a species. Then we have buckeyes. So buckeye butterflies are in that brush foot subgroup still, and they have these big eye spots. <laughs> Excuse my dog in the background crying. <laughs> uh, we have the common buckeye here with these big closed eye spots and the mangrove buckeye. So as you can see on the forewing of the mangrove buckeye, those eye spots are no longer closed. And they're not, it's a little bit more drab looking than that common buckeye was. Mangrove buckeyes we do see along the lagoon though because their host plant is black mangroves. Or maybe red mangroves for that guy, one of the mangrove species. Then we'll jump into emperors. Emperors are medium-sized butterflies that have an orange spotted pattern. Their host plants are hackberry trees. We don't see them much in the garden, but they do occur in the region. And these guys can be attracted to sweat. So they'll take a little sip of your sweat to help balance that diet they have of nectar, which is mostly sugar. So the hackberry emperor has this sort of powdery green eye spots, whereas the tawny emperor, the eye spots are a bit smaller and not as noticeable. The coloring is also slightly different on the dorsal side. Now satyrs. Satyrs are a group of butterflies that we don't see in the garden very often. Um, we usually see them in more forested areas. They're brown, they have swollen veins, and a lot of them have ventral eye spots. They're small to medium-sized butterflies, so again, that one and a quarter to about three inches. So the southern pearly eye is the largest satyr. Again, has eye spots, brown, swollen veins. Carolina satyr, same thing, those brown eye spots, swollen veins. Georgia satyr kind of has these oblong eye spots, but again, brown with swollen veins. They have the little wood satyr, again, <laughs> eye spots, swollen veins is brown. These are some satyr butterflies that have been seen at Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge, but are not typically common in the region. Same with the Appalachian brown, not common in the region, but seen at Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge. 
Now, a category of butterflies that we're going to dive into a little bit is royalty. So royalty is the category of monarchs, essentially. So royalty are brushfoot butterflies and includes the monarch and queen, which are of the same genus. But then we also include the viceroy, which is a malarian mimic in this category. So monarchs are one of the most iconic and recognizable butterflies in North America. We all have either seen a monarch in person or seen a picture of a monarch. They have this sort of stained glass window hind wing, which is an important characterizing feature compared to the other two species in this category. So monarchs obviously make this migration that we've all heard about, which is really cool. They migrate from pretty much all across North America. So from the northern parts of the US down to Mexico, some butterflies instead of going to Mexico come down into Florida. And in Florida, we have a non-migratory population as well as a migratory population. So we have both here in Florida. Um, I will go ahead and send you all some resources about the importance of native milkweed because we have a milkweed species that's growing here in Florida called tropical milkweed that is really, really harmful to monarch butterflies. And it is the species of milkweed that is sold in most box stores. So I'll go ahead and send you guys the information on that because as um, sort of our butterfly citizen scientists, uh, you can help spread the word about how horrible this tropical milkweed is for our native butterflies and our native monarchs specifically, which we've lost over 80% of the monarch population in the United States since the 1990s. So native milkweed is really, really important for the survival of the species. Again, that host plant being taken out of the environment was one of the main reasons why we've lost our monarchs. Queens are in this royalty category. Queens are a little bit smaller than monarchs. Their dorsal view is much different. As you can see, it's darker red with white spots. And the ventral view is quite similar to the actual monarch itself, but again, that dorsal view of the queen is much different with that darker red and those white spots with no stripes. And they're a little bit smaller, so you can notice the difference as they're flying out in the field. And then the viceroy. This butterfly does a really good job of mimicking the monarch. So the viceroy is actually a malarian mimic, so it's sort of a case in evolution where two dangerous or poisonous organisms evolved to look similar. So originally scientists thought that viceroys were mimicking monarchs pretending to be poisonous, but it turns out that these guys are poisonous too. They have a different host plant, but the same situation as before with the pipe vine swallowtails. The plant that the caterpillars eat build up toxins within their body and they bring this into adulthood. So the viceroy butterfly is toxic to predators just like the monarch and the queen are, but they are of different families. The viceroy has this line that goes through its hind wing from the dorsal and ventral view, whereas monarchs and queens have that stained glass look. So that's how you can tell them apart. Next, we have skippers. We're gonna go through skippers really fast. Um, we have spread wing skippers, and then we have grass skippers and giant skippers. These butterflies are really small, so less than an inch. Oh, there we go. Less than an inch to up to three inches for the larger skippers. And they're very moth-like. So spread wing skippers rest with their wings open, contrary to most butterflies. So the mangrove skipper is dark. Silver spotted skipper has a silver spot. Hey, her scallop wing has scallop wings. Common checkered skipper, we've seen this guy in the garden with its wings again open. Then we have spread wing long tail skippers, which have long tails. So we have the long tail skipper, which has this iridescent blue color, as well as the durantis long tailed skipper, which is the drab long tail skipper. It's more brown. Then we have our cloudy wing skippers, which are brown with white spots. So we have the southern cloudy wing, the northern cloudy wing, and the confused cloudy wing. So this butterfly is called the confused cloudy wing because you can't tell the difference between the northern, the southern, and the confused. So for our monitoring purposes, we're just gonna leave it at cloudy wing for our garden project. Then we have dusky wing skippers, which again, all look very similar. They're kind of a duller pattern. They don't have as exaggerated white markings. So we have the sleepy dusky wing, the Horace's dusky wing, in the Zaruko dusky wing. Again, keeping it at dusky wing is better for us when it comes to monitoring. And as you go and learn more about butterflies, you can dive into them a little bit deeper. Oops, forgot about the juveniles dusky wing as well. Now, last group, grass skippers. These guys look a lot like moths and they sit in this jet plane position, which you can see in these first two photos. They sit like a fighter plane. 
Um, they're all orange to brown in color. They all look exactly the same. So we're going to fly through this category of butterflies. There's over 30 species in the state of Florida, and I'm telling you, they all look extremely similar. So for our monitoring purposes, for our garden project, we just keep it broad at Grass Skipper. But as you learn about butterflies even more, you can dive into it further. So I have, I don't even think I'm going to say the names. I think I'm just going to click through, but we'll start with Swarthy Skipper, Three Spotted Skipper, Clouded Skipper, Southern Skipperling, Lee Skipper, Fiery Skipper, Mesky Skipper, Tawny Edge Skipper, Whirlabout. It keeps going and it keeps going and they all look very similar. They're all brown, yellow, sit in the fighter plane position, are smaller size, three inches or less. Berry Skipper, Dunn Skipper, Monk Skipper, Dusted Skipper. We have over 30 species of these guys. They all look exactly the same, but they use different host plants and they're essential to Florida's habitat. And then we get to our giant skippers, which are grass skippers on steroids. They're just really robust and much larger than the other grass skippers. We only have two of these. We have the yucca giant skipper, which is our more common species that we would see in our region. And then we have the Kofaki giant skipper, which you would not typically see in our region. It's more panhandle and further north in Florida. So those are all the butterflies of the Indian River Lagoon region of Eastern Central Florida. These are all of our morpho groups again as a review and I'll send you all the packet of butterflies um, with the photos and the different groups. I know we flew through that, there was a lot to cover. So butterflies, active during the day, bright colors, clubbed antenna, usually, right, rest with their wings together unless they're spread wing skippers. And we have to compare them to moths. So again, moths and butterflies are of the same order. They're, for every one species of butterfly, there are 10 species of moths. So there are way more moths than butterflies. Moths fly at night. They typically have duller coloring. They have feathered antenna. You might be able to see that in some of these pictures. So they don't have clubbed antenna. And this is that tent position that we'd mentioned in the beginning of the PowerPoint, the one on the upper left and lower right, have that tented typical moth position. Of course, not all moths are dull and some do fly during the day, like this moth here on the upper right, but um, butterflies can be considered day flying moths that use chrysalis. So next steps, um, continue the citizen science training with us. Join us on our next webinar, June 22nd, and join us for Pollinator Palooza. It'll be a really fun time. I'll send more details via email. And again, like I said, this is just a crash course. So here are some resources that you can go to to learn even more about our native butterfly species. And of course, there are plenty of things we can do at home to help the Indian River Lagoon, and there are plenty of things that I can use volunteers for in the garden. So please reach out to me if you're interested in joining us for any of our garden work days or bio blitzes or anything like that. So again, here is our pollinator palooza information and the information for our third webinar. Like I did last time, I'll send these slides and all the information and resources I talked about and a follow-up email. Thank you to everyone whose pictures were in this PowerPoint and the Mayos who are here on this webinar today. And thank you all for joining us. So I know that we flew through that. We have hit 7 p.m. So if any of you wanna stick around to ask questions, that's totally fine. I can hang out for a few minutes, but for those of you who are ready to move on with your night, you can go ahead and leave us. I will not take offense at all. That was a lot of information and it was quite a long webinar, but I um, can try to stick around for a few minutes if I don't get kicked off of Teams. We'll see how that goes. Like, you know, I'm not very techy. So um, if Teams will let us stay on, I'll stay here to answer a couple of questions, but otherwise, thank you all so much for joining us. It is 7 p.m., so have a great night if you're leaving. And again, thank you so, so much. Um, we love being able to reach wider audience with these webinars, and we really appreciate your patience. Okay, so for those of you who are sticking around, we'll go ahead. I only see one question so far. What is the approximate total of butterflies you have found in the garden? Mm, okay, so for monitoring, that total is, mm, I don't know if I have it in these PowerPoint notes. For monitoring, we do have that total. That was in the 
last PowerPoint. Um, I believe it's around 100 and something that we've seen during monitoring. However, I don't know how many butterflies we've seen while we've been up there working in the garden. We have an iNaturalist page that has um, pictures of some of the species, but I, I have the numbers for when we're doing the monitoring transects, but I don't have the total numbers of butterflies we found in general. Um, because most of the time when we're up there doing work, we see butterflies and we're just not recording it because we're focusing on something else like weeding or garden maintenance. But we do have the totals for monitoring, which is seven and a half minutes, usually once a month over the last 12 months. How many butterflies we've seen in that time frame? Um, next question. Do we need to give you our email address? to get the PDF slides. So if you got the email link for this presentation, I have your email address in my pollinator month email list. So I will automatically send you the follow up for this presentation. You don't need to worry about that. If you don't get it from me by um, the end of next week, then start bugging me because I should have sent it by then and maybe I missed your email. But all of you who are here are on the email list, so you should automatically get the resource um, links after the webinar wraps up. It just takes me a day or so to type it all up and put it all together. Next question about how many different native plants have been planted. So in the garden, we started off with planting 26 native plant species. Um, we just planted four more last Wednesday, so that gets us to 30. And then um, we probably planted maybe another four or so a few months ago that I forgot to keep track of. <laughs> and we've had natives that have popped up as weeds that we didn't plant. So we planted, let's say, 30 or so native plants, but I would say we have even more in the garden because of weeds. Ooh, of the 30 plus, how many are host plants? Great question. I believe most of them should be. Um, I can do a little bit further digging. So the plants were selected either to serve bees or butterflies or both. So most of the plants that we planted are host plants for at least one species. So um, that was a lot of what our research went into for months at the beginning of this project. So of the 30, I would say most of them are host plants, but I can do a double check and make sure. Um, Karina shared two days ago, we visited Dolphin Mall, which is off of the Florida Turnpike in Doral area. But they have hundreds of Kuntis in the parking lot and there must have been thousands of Atala butterflies swarming the entire area. It was an amazing sight. That sounds like an amazing sight. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that. Here in Fort Pierce, uh, when they redid our Publix a few years ago, they planted Kunti on the Publix parking lot. And uh, last spring was the first time I'd really noticed the crazy amount of Atalas in the Publix parking lot of Fort Pierce. And I was running around like a crazy woman taking pictures of the Atalas and the Caterpillars in the Publix parking lot. And my fiance was yelling at me to get back in the car because I was embarrassing him. So... Um, these native plantings of Atalas, even if they're along roadways of the turnpike or in public parking lots, they do make a big difference for these insects because these butterflies, the smaller species don't fly as far. So monarchs are a big butterfly species. They fly really far. Smaller species can live sort of their whole life cycle within a very small area, um, within maybe a couple thousand feet. Um, they can stay pretty local. So all it really takes is one uh, turnpike rest area or one public parking lot to really make a difference um, in bringing these species habitat. Next question, do we or will we monitor for caterpillars? So we are sort of at our maximum capacity for official kind of monthly type monitoring right now with bees and butterflies. However, we do have our iNaturalist page where people can, who are in the garden often and can take pictures of caterpillars and upload them to iNaturalist so we can kind of have a count of what species of caterpillar and a little bit of how many through our iNaturalist page. But if anybody wanted to do a particular caterpillar bio blitz, 
please feel free to email me. We can get a group together and go out and just see how many caterpillars we can find um, it within an hour time period or something like that to try to get an idea of our caterpillar diversity. I think that would be really cool. But no, as of right now, we don't do any caterpillar monitoring besides through photographs in iNaturalist. All right. If anyone has any further questions, last chance to throw them in the chat box. I refuse to go more than 10 minutes over <laughs> this webinar because we all need to eat some snacks and go to sleep. Um, but if anybody has any further questions, uh, go ahead and throw them in the chat box. Give you another minute or so. I'm happy to answer. And again, thank you all so much for joining us this evening. I really appreciate your time, uh, your patience with our last webinar, and hopefully I can meet some of you in person at our Pollinator Palooza Saturday, June 24th. I see a little bit more typing going on, but it looks like we are all about wrapped up. So again, thank you all. And thank you to those who stayed for the little bit of Q&A here at the end. Um, and I look forward to seeing you all virtually June 22nd for the Bee webinar and in person June 24th for Pollinator Palooza. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great night.